going to move on to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, open with me there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 48. That ought to be fun. Because if y'all think I'm reading all 48 verses by myself. Ooh. Not happening. All right, Matthew chapter 5. I am going to open up and I'll start the reading and talk a little bit about the Beatitudes themselves. But there are two occasions where uh, these Beatitudes are mentioned. And one place is called the Sermon on the Mount. Another place is called the Sermon on the Plain. Uh, and the story and the retelling of the events by Matthew are referred to the Sermon on the Mount. And the telling and retelling of it by Luke is called the Sermon on the Plain. And the reason these are called different and the reason there's a, you'll find that Luke covered some other areas that it doesn't appear that Matthew covered is because there's a belief that these were two different events. And so they believe that Jesus taught some things more than one time. Shocking, right? Because repetition is a good teacher. All right, so Matthew chapter 5 begins this way. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. When he was seated, and his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now what does that mean to you? Who are the poor in spirit? What say of you? This is going to be class tonight. And I'm the school teacher. What do you think it means? Just raise your hand when you think you have an answer. What do you think it means by poor in spirit? Anybody else? Blessed are the poor in spirit. But look what it says. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Humble. Humble in spirit. Okay. And, and together you almost have a true picture. When you think of the poor, you think of what? Somebody who is without and they're hungry. Right? So what if you replace that and said, Blessed are the hungry in spirit. Let's have a hungry spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if you are poor in spirit, meaning you have very little spirit, and you are hungry for more, and you keep that mentality about you while you live for God, then you're going to always be reaching for more. And as long as you're reaching for more, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As long as you're hungry after the spirit, as long as you want more, you're guaranteed a spot in heaven. Right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And this one isn't as difficult. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And there are many reasons why we mourn, which means to cry or to weep. We mourn at death when people die in our family. We mourn when uh, grief strikes a home. We mourn when things don't go our way sometimes. But we mourn, and he says, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And what is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is our comforter. And so this is a promise to, the, to us that when we hit a place of mourning, and we will because we're human, when we hit those situations, the comforter is guaranteed to help us in that situation. So, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Now what does meek mean? Class. 
What does meek mean? Meek, not meat. Meek. Don't get hungry on Blessed are the humble. You can replace meek with humble. Blessed are those that are humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, it guarantees that you'll be filled. What does the scripture say about the worshipers? He seeketh us to worship him that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? So if he's seeking you and you're seeking him, you're going to be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And this falls into that same category of give, and it shall be given unto you. If you show mercy, when you when you have every right to slam a fist down and say, you owe me. <clears throat> or, uh, you're in the right. And you have a right to judge someone or be in judgment of someone. Mm -hmm. But instead, you could hang that over their head for eternity. Or you're quick to say, you know what, I'm just going to let that go. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They had a bad day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And whether they had a bad day or not, I'm not going to be the one to hold this over their head. There's enough people in the world to do that to you. If you are that person, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's why it's important to understand you don't know some people until you walk a mile in their shoes. All right. And so it is good to be merciful to others when you don't understand why they act the way they act. Right. Because one day you're going to need it yourself. Amen. And the scripture teaches us that uh, forgive those that trespass against us, Lord. Or Father, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. So if we're not readily giving mercy then mercy will be withheld from us. But if we're quick to forgive and quick to release, then it will also be quickly forgiven of us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we all know what pure means, right? If you're pure in heart, you shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Peacemakers. What is a peacemaker? And y'all are full of just vitality and violence tonight. Someone who doesn't provoke. Someone who doesn't provoke. Okay, a peacemaker is someone who doesn't provoke. What else is a peacemaker? Doesn't take sides. Judy? Um, a peacemaker. It makes peace? Because you said a peacemaker. Very, that's very simply it. Yeah. It's somebody who finds a turbulent situation and makes peace out of it. Or brings peace to it. So if, if you were the guy in school, and I was one of those guys, where the couple of guys get mad at each other, even the girls, and they come grab me and say, this one said this, and this and that, and the other. And, and I felt like it was my job to go try to help them resolve their problem and be friends again. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, I didn't just say persecuted. Just because you get picked on. Because you overeat or undereat. Usually one or the other. Uh, no, it says those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In other words, you're trying to live holy, you're trying to live righteous, and you're persecuted for that. You're picked on. Ladies, because you don't cut your hair. You're picked on because you wear long skirts or dresses. You're picked on because you don't wear makeup or earring. You're picked on. And you feel that peer pressure being persecuted. Now, that is a very light affliction because overseas they're stoned. And you can be killed. And that's true persecution when you're killed for your difference or you standing up and being righteous for his name's sake. It says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of 
heaven. And then he goes on to say, verse 11, Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and shall say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Not just any reason, but when they do it because you're making a stand for Him. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, I'm telling you, this is a difficult thing to do. Somebody's picking on you and making fun of you and telling you you're a holy roller and telling you you're a self-righteous person and this, that, and the other, and you're supposed to rejoice in that. Thank you! I'm so glad you feel that way. You make my day today. Thank you so much. I appreciate every compliment. It don't work like that usually. It usually hurts your feelings, bothers you, makes you want to go off to a closet somewhere. But he said we should actually be glad. Not just glad, but exceedingly glad. You come out of an office and somebody's standing up and they're coming against you because they, they know who you are and they're standing up making a little preachy, preachy message about people who are self-righteous and think they're holier than thou and you know they're talking about you. And you're sitting there just smiling at them. And then you leave that meeting. Be glad. The, the difficulty is we're brought up in an environment where we want everybody to like us. Guess what? They're not supposed to. Well, if they don't like me, I can't win them to the Lord. Not true. It took me a while to win a couple of them that didn't like me. But some of them, want, I, I turned around a lot faster than those who liked me. Because I loved them anyway. Even when they treated me bad, I was friendly. Come on, man. Because I was careful with them, I eventually convinced them, hey, you ain't got to be this way. And then if the Holy Ghost jumps in and helps you, say, you know the reason you pick on me? It's because you like me. <laughs> And after a while, you might be able to turn that person or at least pique their interest mm -hmm. and help them. So some of those folks are the ones that you can turn. But, verse 12, let me get a reader, Brother James. I'm sorry, I'm beyond verse 12. No, I'm not. I lost my spot. Verse 13. Brother James Palmer. I tell him he's the only James here tonight, so we know it's in this. That's right. Can't run, can't have. Verse 13 and 14. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to cast out, and to be trodden under foot of men. Now let me, let me add this piece. Uh, in ancient times, the salt was not refined. Uh, There's always some portion of chemical present in addition to sodium chloride. And, and especially in this particular time frame. And if the fraction useful for flavoring food was leached away by dampness, what remained was without value. It was sometimes strung on paths like gravel, since it was then good for nothing. And that's what he's referencing in this passage. That salt, it, it got wet. The good salt kind of ran away, and all that was left was chemical, rock, whatever you want to call it. And so that was just thrown on the path because you couldn't eat it. It wasn't going to flavor nothing. So it just became something that was trampled underfoot. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Does it? Uh, keep going on through 15 and 16. Okay. Um, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it give it light unto all that are in the house. But your light so shone before men that they might that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, so you are the light of the world. When you step out there in the workplace, those people, no matter how much they smile and laugh and get along, 
just like we do. They're in darkness. And that laughter and stuff you're seeing is very temporary for them. So the deal is this. When you're there, you're the light. So you should be contrasting them. That don't mean they're, when they're laughing, you're like, it's <laughs> okay, funny. It don't mean you're all cantankerous. But at the same time, you're supposed to be so different from everything else in the workplace. Your countenance, your presence, when you speak to them, when you talk to them, when you greet them, when you listen to them. Your countenance is supposed to be so di different that it attracts people in an odd way. It will either repel or attract. Think about this. If you have a light bulb, a light like this, if I'm really close to it and I'm, it's really close to my eyes, it kind of makes me want to get away a little bit, right? kind of repels. kind of repels you when it's that bright because you can't handle it. But now, if the light's over there, I'm perfectly fine with it. I can handle that much light. But this much light, it's a little too much. It's kind of like that in your relationship with the world. Okay? Some people can admire you from afar off. But when they get really close to where you are, and they know what that light's about, it makes you want to back up a little bit. And so don't be afraid if some people are slow to come to you or come around you because they're still dealing with the light that's in you. And so you're either going to repel people or you're going to attract people. Verse 17 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, Paul's right there. If you have ever been guilty of making fun of the Word of God, or a teaching from the Word of God. And you have convinced somebody that that's not necessary. Because mm. mm. you don't want to agree with it. Because that means you've got to change something. And you just want a group of people who don't agree with it. So none of you have to change anything. It says that if you're one of those kind of folks and you teach other people to do the same, you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But the person who loves every bit of word and loves the way it's brought out and loves the teaching and loves the commandments, you are going to be great in the kingdom of heaven. He said, For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees' righteousness was hypocritical. It was for show. He called them whited sepulchers because they looked all right on the outside, but they were dead on the inside. He said, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, and what would it take to surpass theirs? It would have to get past the facade and get into the heart. Right? And that's why that one song does a good job. It talks about being holy from the inside. Clean me up inside. Okay? He starts on the inside and starts working his way to the outside. Because you will bear fruit of what's in your spirit. If you want to be holy, you'll show it on the outside. If you don't care, it'll show up in your attitude from the, which comes from the inside. And it'll show up in your attire, which is right there in front of everybody's face. Your clothes say more about you than you think. If you're walking down Main Street, you see a guy in a suit. What do you think? Business. Sharp. Smart. Sharp. Smart. Business oriented. He's a businessman. 
Could be a preacher. Hard to tell the difference. <coughs> right? But if you're walking down the same street and you see a guy uh, with work clothes on and they got paint all over him, a caulk all over him, his hair's disheveled, and his uh, hat's messed up, what do you think about him? Hard worker. Hard worker. Hard worker. Somebody else might say, Quran worker. You know, depending on what your view is. But if you, uh, <laughs> if you go into like McDonald's and, uh, they're not wearing a hair net. You find the hair in your food. You're going to wish they wore the uniform, ain't you? Mm -hmm. So if the world has a uniform, don't you think God has a uniform? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. He has a uniform. Because the world is a copycat. God has a uniform. So, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. See, sometimes we do get angry without a real cause. The devil will whisper something in our ear like, you see the way he looked at you? Come on, bro. Preach it. You see the way he dissed you in that conversation? Why, he didn't even shake my hand. That's the way the song goes. <laughs> so we get angry without a real good... We, we get angry without cause or evidence. Mm -hmm. We suspect. We become suspicious. The enemy gets in there and makes us suspicious. They haven't talked to me lately. They whisper when I come around. And so we start getting angry and talking about it. Look, they always talk about me when I go by. Brother mm -hmm. well, so-and-so, sister so-and-so. <laughs> So we get angry. So he said, you're in danger of the judgment when you get angry without a cause. And whosoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And that word Raka means worthless. If you ever look at a brother and sister, it also means empty. If you ever look at a brother and sister and say, Raka, which means you're worthless. You are empty. You're practically blaspheming God if they have the Spirit of God in them because you said they're worthless and empty when the most valuable thing is located inside of them. That's why you're in danger. And it was a slang word and a word that was used much in that time frame when they called somebody worthless. Raka. Not one of the worst insults you can give somebody. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And again, it's referring to how you treat your brother. Right. A stranger. And we've got to be careful calling people fools when they cut us off on the highway. But you especially want to be careful calling your brother a fool. Because you're in danger of the hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Right. Right. This is one of the most one of the most prevalent missing pieces in the church. We don't want to go tell nobody to defend us. Mm -hmm. Or you know your brother's upset with you because you did something or they think you did something and you just think, well, they should get over it. Yeah. No, you should go make sure that you have peace between you. That's, right. That's the scripture. Why? It says, because if you go lay your gift, meaning sacrifice at an altar, if you come to repent, while you're asking God to forgive you, He's saying, I'm not, until you get up and go make it right, Brother Keith. That night, I, was, I corrected Brother James up here. I went to go pray, and I couldn't get very far. Because in my flesh, I overreacted a little bit. So I had to walk back there and say, Brother James, I'm sorry I handled that completely wrong and I didn't mean to offend you. After I left that, come up here and pray, boom, I broke right through. But I had to go fix that. And that might seem small. I didn't think he was out of order. Well, maybe I wasn't out of order. But at the same time, I, I could have embarrassed him in front of everyone by, you know, yeah, I had a headache. Yeah, I, uh, I was trying to bring things back into order, but I still could have treated him better than that. There's a better way. And so I need to fix that. 
so I could talk to God again. Because I was struggling over here. I couldn't, couldn't get anywhere because I was worried about how I handled that. But once I fixed it with God, I went about it. And God moved. So, be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hands you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And the word adversary there, obviously meaning enemy or someone who's come against you. Uh, and so he's saying, hey, if someone has ought against you on the way, just agree with them. You know, you're right, I'm sorry, I didn't handle it right. Even if you're right, and you didn't say what they said you said, you can find a way to agree with them so that the, the Bible says that a soft answer turneth away wrath. Right? I had a guy, he dented my truck, just bought it, my old blue one. And uh, just bought a parked it way out in the back of the parking lot just so nobody would open their car door against my new truck. Sure enough, <laughs> big bubble parked that thing right next to my truck. And he had a big truck. And he didn't leave much room at all. And when I come out, there's a dent in my door. And his vehicle is the only one who could have done it. And so I just sent a kind of message and said, hey, man, I know we have big trucks. I mean, kind of the parking spots are small and I park way out there, not just for the exercise, although I need it. I said, but I park way out there so there's enough space for us big guys and our big vehicles that we don't open the door too fast. And, and Bing, and I said, you park next to me, it looks like you might have caught my car door. And I said, I'm just, I'm just asking maybe not park so close to my vehicle. And buddy, Next thing I know, my door slamming open. This big burly guy standing in the doorway, and I'm sitting down doing my work, and I don't even forget I sent it. It was like early in the morning. He was in conference calls all day. He comes in at the end of the day, and he is fuming. You're just a troublemaker, aren't you? I heard you as a troublemaker. I heard you like to start stuff. And I was like, no, sir. I usually don't like to start anything at all. So, my car on the way to work. I mean, no, sir, I don't usually like to start anything. What's this? Oh, I said, this is about the email. I said, yeah, it's about the email. I didn't open my car door, my truck door on your car. I said, do you know that for 100% sure? Yeah. And I said, well, man, and the paint matches yours. You were parked next to me. It wasn't there. It wasn't there until after you were next to me. So maybe it's just you didn't know you did it. No, I know I didn't do it. He started bailing me, and then it just kicked up a gear. He turned red in the face, and he started swearing. He said a whole bunch of other stuff. And I finally just backed down, and I said, I said, you know what, man? You're right. I should have sent that email. I had no way of really knowing whether it was you or not. I just assumed, and I shouldn't have done that, so I apologize. And he went, oh, okay. I appreciate that. And in five seconds, we were having a Christian conversation about where you go to church and what do you do and how do you believe and everything else. So a soft answer will turn away wrath. If you find an adversary in the way, agree. And move on. You can get out of the room while you've got a chance. All right. Brother Keith. Read for me verse 27 through 30. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right eye, I mean if thy right hand offend thee, 
cut it off and cast it from you. For it is probable to be that one of thy members should perish, not thy whole body should be cast into hell. All right. So number one, not only are you guilty of adultery or fornication when you're actually in the act, but Jesus is saying if you look at that woman and she's not yours, you're not married, you have no claim to her, then and you lust after her, and in your mind, you go through the act, then you have created adultery, and you, you've committed sin in your heart and in your mind. And most affairs that happen in our country happen in the heart before they ever happen in the physical. And so he's basically saying, like he said to uh, in the Cain and Abel situation, watch your countenance because sin crouches at the door. Okay? So it's kind of the same thing that you got to be careful what you're looking at, what you're thinking about, and how long you dwell there because it can take root in your heart and manifest itself. But not only that, he flat says, if you did it in your heart, if you thought about it in your heart, then you have committed adultery or fornication. So we have to repent. How do we fix it? We just back up and repent, put up safeguards, and try to block that stuff before it gets too far down the road. I woke up in the middle of the morning having some nasty dream about somebody I don't even know, and I wake up and repent for adultery and fornication and perverse and anything else I can think of because I don't want none of that in me. We can't control our subconscious most of the time, especially when we're sleeping. But we can put up safeguards to where we pay attention to what we're watching. We pay attention to what we're reading. And we're not planting any information in there that can cause those things later. So about, that's the safeguards that we put in place. We watch what we're looking at. We pay attention to what we're putting in our eyes. So, then he goes on to talk, talk about if your hand offends you, cut it off. Do you think Jesus literally meant that, uh, you know, I don't know, you got mad and slapped somebody? That... You should have your right arm cut off. Do you think he meant that, um, you know, you got mad at the dog and kicked it across the room, you should lose your foot? Or, bless God, you couldn't get away from pornography, so you should lose both eyes? What would be easier, to cut off those members or to remove and cut off the things that are tempting those members? Right? So if you have a problem with pornography, it's probably best you don't have any media around at all. Right. Don't have a laptop. Don't have a phone that has access to media. I'm serious. Because if you have a problem with that, and that is your access, mm -hmm. and you can't control yourself, you're better to go without that and just get you a little flip phone mm -hmm. so that you go to heaven right. and do without the phone. But, but his point is this. If you've got to go in halt and maimed and cut up and chopped up, just get in. Do what you got to do to get to heaven. Cut off what you got to cut off to get to heaven. But he didn't literally mean to go cut off. He was making a point. The severity of the point was if you had to. I mean, maybe you're better off to wear a blindfold the rest of your life if your eyes keep getting in trouble. You know. Get to heaven by whatever means necessary. Get that part of you that keeps getting offended free of those temptations and those situations. So cut them off. Alright. Jesus forbids oaths. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Everybody say that. Do not swear at all. Very good. Neither by heaven... For it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Wow. Pretty plain. So if it's got to be... Uh, blank yes, then that didn't come from God. Hmm? You know what I'm saying? Blank yes! That did not come from God. Yes is a good answer. 
No is a good answer. But all this extra explorative are not necessary. And they do not come from God. Go to the second mile. Verse 38 says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him also. <laughs> I don't know exactly how you're supposed to do that. I don't want to taunt him make me hit me again. <laughs> but basically, he's saying, don't hit him back. I show him the other cheek. You know, if you hit this cheek, I'm going this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> James keeps at me. <laughs> I can't help but think about the Uncle Bill's story. He may have an incident or two in the past reference points there. Uncle Bill. But, but if, you, if you turn to him this cheek, I mean, you're basically just turning back around. And you know what? If you need to get it out of your system, here's another cheek. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not your enemy. I'm not going to fight you. That's what it's supposed to be about. That's difficult. Because if you're a man, you're ready to turn the other cheek all right and it's followed by a right cross. <laughs> and as Pastor Adams used to say, he told you to turn the right cheek, but he really didn't say anything about what happens next. <laughs> That's wrong, man. But here's the thing. As men, we're to guard our house. You touch my kids, you're going to get a fight. That's my wife, you're going to get a fight. You need to slap me around, go for it. But I'm not going to let you, I'm going to guard, protect what God's given me. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Let me talk to you about borrowing for a moment. Don't let your human compassion get away from you. Do not go into debt loaning to people what you do not have. I'm guilty. I let my human compassion get out there and I'll go borrow money so that somebody can have money. The guy's been convicting me of that lately because I've, I've, I've strained myself. Because I'm given something I really don't have. I have to, if I have to borrow it from the bank to give to you, then I'm not giving it to you. It's not me doing it. And I'm putting myself in a hole that I may not be able to get out too long after you're gone and the debt's not paid. My wife and I both, early on in our marriage, helped friends this way and they both walked off. They walked off and left us with the debt, $15,000 worth. Mm -hmm. Friends, family, then we took out loans for to buy cars or to deal with something. Oh, I'm going to pay you back. Never did. And we're sitting there holding on to $15,000 worth of debt that we didn't get nothing out of. We had to pay somebody else's debt back. So we, we've, we've been down that road a few times. And my advice to you is if you don't have it on you, do not loan it because you don't have it to loan. Okay? Because it says... Later on here, it says that if you lend, don't look to receive it back again. Look what it says. Love your enemies. 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say that you love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Yeah, even the neighbor. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Kind of like Jesus did. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, so you can be like your daddy. This is what you have to do. This is what he did. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? How different are you than anyone else if you love those who love you? Where is that exceeding love in? Do not even tax collectors do the same? 
And it, they hated tax collectors. It's just so funny how often the tax collectors mentioned in the Word of God. They were just considered the most evil, vile people. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And, and in Luke chapter 6, covers the same things. But I'm just going to look at a couple of things, and I'm going to wrap up. A couple of things that it does not cover. Okay? Luke chapter 6, and we're going to skip down to about 24. Now this is right after the Beatitudes, and Luke talks about woes. Now all Mark, talk, all Matthew talked about was blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are the, those that mourn, blessed are those who have people hate you, blessed are the persecuted, blessed, blessed, blessed. But Jesus also talked about woe unto you. Okay, we get to Luke chapter six, verse twenty-four through twenty-six. He says, "But woe to you who are rich." That kind of kills the whole American dream. In other words, you're not supposed to get rich. What? <laughs> but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. That's all you're going to get. Because listen, if you're pursuing money for wealth, you'll have to say no to God and everything else in life in order to really get rich. Which he's saying is, that's all you get in life. That's it. That's all you don't get is what you get down here. Because you've forsaken God to get there, so you're not going to go anywhere but hell afterward. So, woe unto the rich. And then verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and you shall weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. So if everybody likes you, woe to you. That means there's something wrong if everybody likes you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. So he's saying all these woes to say, hey, this is what they did to the prophets. They'll stone you before it's over, in other words. And then he goes into, and we're going to wrap up here, love your enemies. But I say to you, verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who despitefully use you. To him who strikes you on, on, one, on the one cheek, offer the other also. So there it says offer. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. How can we expect to be treated with respect if we don't give respect? And, and this is this is... This is teenagerville right here. This is this is where we learn this is in our teen years. Because we want to rebel against authority. It's just that nice little what happens in our life is our hormones are starting to shape up and we're in between being a kid and being an adult and we're feeling all these mature feelings and, and yet we still have immature understanding. And so every Adolescent into adulthood. We all experience a season of rebellious nature trying to rise up in us because we're struggling to become adults, but we don't we're not there yet. We don't have the responsibilities, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the understanding. And we want to demand an adult's attention, but we want to act like kids. I, I don't want no responsibility, but I'm an adult, you better respect me. Right? And, you know, uh, I had one of my good uh, beat downs when I was trying to tell my mom and dad how to handle their finances at 17 years old. And I figured it out. Y'all don't keep y'all's checkbook right. You better stay away from them credit cards. That's what's getting you in trouble. Oh, excuse me, son. Yeah. Pastor Jeff 
you got him a spanking when he was just Jeff. Because he got mouthy trying to tell mom and dad how to keep their books. And at the end of the day, that's probably right. But, <laughs> that's beside the point. That's beside the point. So you need to give respect if you want respect. What, what, it still goes back to what? Give, and it shall be given unto you. If you are having trouble getting people to respect you, it's probably because you don't respect anybody. It's truth. You got to love it. it, it that's what it boils down to. If you want respect, you got to give respect. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Talking about interest, really. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return. It means I'm going to let you borrow this and I'm not going to ask for 10% interest. Hey, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and your, you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. It looks like I'm weird when I'm ready to let my hair down or something. What hair? Just lay down. Hey, up the poor man, I've got the most. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Let's pray over the word. Thank you, Father, for the word that we have received tonight. We thank you, Lord. I pray, oh God, that in our reading and in our hearing, Lord, that our faith is built in you, Jesus. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I thank you, Lord, for the Beatitudes. Thank you for what we've learned from them. I thank you, Lord, for the woes what we can learn from them, oh God. I thank you, Lord, for your principles. Plant this word in our heart. Plant it deep into our spirit and help us to learn to walk in your ways, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you honor. And we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.